Hello everyone. Um, as you can see, I'm using a slightly different setup today. I decided to switch to trying OneNote instead of the other program I was using. Um, I think I liked how it worked a little better in my other class that I used it for, so we'll see how it goes this time. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to talk more about uh, rank and nullity. And today's going to be a little bit of kind of a grab bag. There's just a few different kind of aspects of rank and nullity I want to get to today. Um, so I want to start by just reminding you what rank and nullity both mean. So this was section, now I forget, I think 4.6 in the book. And the, the section of the book is just called rank, but we're also talking about this concept called nullity. So I'll just, I'll say rank and nullity. So basically, um, rank is just a fancy way of saying the dimension of the column space of a matrix. So um, the rank of a matrix A is um, the dimension of the span, or sorry, let me say it this way, the dimension of the column space of A. And then the nullity of a matrix A is the dimension of the null space of the matrix A. Um, and so using these two new words, we have this thing called the rank nullity theorem. Um, and it basically tells you that there's a certain relationship between uh, rank and nullity. So the rank nullity theorem tells us that um, for any matrix A, the rank of that matrix A plus the nullity of that matrix A um, is going to equal the number of columns. So I guess I should have uh, said that somewhere. I'll write that below here. So where A is an M by N matrix. So we talked about why that was last time. Basically, it's because we saw that the um, the number of pivot columns of a matrix tell you the dimension of the column space. And then the number of non-pivot columns tell you the dimension of the null space. And so if you add together all the pivot and non-pivot columns, that adds up to the total number of columns. Um, so we'll come back to talking about rank and nullity and doing some examples in a minute. Um, before that, I just wanted to actually kind of sidetrack and just go through one quick example, kind of similar to what we were doing um, both like a little bit in yes yesterday's lecture and the one before that, um, just reviewing kind of the difference between, you know, the span of a set of vectors and the spanning set and the column space and the basis. I just feel like I've gotten a few different questions from people um, that are just making me realize that I think you'd benefit from kind of going through all that again. So I want to do that and then we'll come back to rank and nullity and do a couple of examples related to that. Um, okay, so let me think what I want to title this. So basically just going to review, you know, what's the difference between um, span, spanning sets, bases, etc. So I want to do that by looking at an example. So pretty similar to examples that we've done in the past, but I just think it's a good type of example to work with. So we have a two by three matrix. I think even though we've done examples like this, one thing that I like to think about sometimes with teaching is that sometimes as an instructor, you have this feeling where you feel like you keep, you've told students something before and it's like, you know, why do I have to keep telling it to them? And I think sometimes it just matters when you hear that information, right? So sometimes you hear something in class and you're just like not really ready for it yet because you haven't really hit a point in your homework or whatever it is where you've had to actually like 
require your understanding of that. And then, so when you get to that kind of stuck point, then you're ready to, to ask the question. And so I just wanted to go over it again for that reason. I think maybe some of you now are to the point where you are ready to, um, to make sure you understand the difference between all these different things. Okay. So let's say that we were trying to find the column space of this matrix. So the column space of A, by definition, right, the, the definition of the column space of a matrix is that it is the span of the columns. So we have the span of these three columns. Um, and just to even go a step further, let's remind ourselves what that even means. So what, what does the span of a set means, or what does it mean? It means the set of all possible linear combinations of those three vectors. So just to be really explicit, that's what we mean when we say span. So the span of a set of vectors is infinite, right? It's like all, you could do any combination you want. You could do a million times one negative two plus pi times negative five, three. You can do anything you want with these, um, with these three vectors. So when we're talking about span, we're talking about all the possible linear combinations. Um, and so in this case, if you think about what is the set of all the possible linear combinations of these three vectors, it is all of R2. Because we have these three vectors, they're all in R2, and no, like, there's at least two of them that are not scalar multiples of each other, right? Like, if they're all multiples of the same vector, then it would not be all of R2, but we have at least two different directions um, included in this set. And it can't be more than R2, because the column space has to be a subspace of, subspace of R2, um, because our vectors only have two components. So from here on out, when we're talking about the column space of A, the column space of A is literally equal to R2. And I, I think that's something that's kind of tripping people up. Like you think column space of A and you think it has to have something to do with the matrix. It does, because that's how we're kind of figuring out what that column space is, but literally the column space of this matrix is equal to R2. And so from here on out, anything we say about the column space, you could say it about R2 as well. Okay, so when you have the span of a set of vectors, um, that set of vectors is called a spanning set. So this set, one, negative two, negative five, three, negative four, one, is a spanning set for, I wrote of, I guess that's fine, um, the column space of A, or you could say it's a spanning set of R2 because the column space of A is R2. Um, so a spanning set is just any set whose span is equal to that space. So because the span of these three vectors is equal to the column space of A or R2, that means that this set of vectors is a spanning set. Um, so spanning set is a little bit more general than basis. So a spanning set is literally any set of vectors whose span gives you that space. Um, but in this case, we could also take out a vector, right? We could say one negative two negative five, three, um, that is also a spanning set. of the column space of A or R2. So it still spans. Basically, you know, we haven't, like, if we were then to go down, maybe just to kind of give like a counter example, if I were to say like the set of one negative two, you know, that is not a spanning set because the span of that is just a line. It's not all of R2. 
So just kind of put that there as a counter example. Um, however, we could also come up with a different spanning set. So for example, the set one zero zero one is also a spanning set. of the column space of A. Because the column space of A is R2, and we know that you can span all of R2 with any linear combinations of 1, 0, 0, 1. So this last one, you might look at that and say, wait, that, that doesn't have any of the columns of A in it. And that's okay, it doesn't matter. There's, as long as you can, um, you know, once you know what your column space is, as long as the set that you're writing down as long as any linear combination of those vectors can give you every vector in that column space, it is a spanning set of that column space. So we have two uh, spanning sets written down. So the two that we wrote down that have only two elements, these two are also called bases. So this is also a basis for the column space of A, or equivalently, you could say it's a basis for R2. Um, this one here is also a basis for the column space of A or R2. So the ones that are not bases, so the, the, the first spanning set we had, that has too many vectors in it. So in order to be a basis, the vectors need to be linearly independent. And so you can't have three linearly independent vectors in R2. So that first um, set that we put down is not a basis for the column space of A. Um, but the two that, we, that I just put a box around, those ones are bases. And so now when it comes to talking about dimension, the dimension of any vector space is just the number of vectors in a basis for that space. So in this case, we can say that the dimension of the column space of A is equal to two because the any basis you could come up with for this column space is gonna have two vectors in it. And then we also have another rank uh, or another name for that now, which is that it's the rank of, um, of our matrix. So hopefully that, again, I know we did an example really similar to this before, but you know, I think sometimes seeing it again at the right time can be helpful. Okay, so we're gonna get back now to talking about um, rank and nullity. I mean, this was a little bit about it, but more explicitly talking about rank and nullity. So I wanna look at a couple of examples and, and I think these are gonna be kind of tricky. Um, and there's a couple of them like this on your online homework. Um, but let me, I was thinking if I want to write both of them at once, I'll write them one at once, uh, one at a time. So this is a, an ex example where I think it would be nice if you would pause and try to do it yourself first. Um, it is tricky, like I said, but I think just trying to like see what you can get out of it yourself first might be beneficial. So let's say A is a um, three by five matrix. So the two questions are, or actually, sorry, there's four questions. Um, so what is, and I'm gonna write down four things. So the four things are um, the largest possible um, rank, or let me say it this way, the largest possible value of rank A. So what's like the biggest number that the rank of A could be? Uh, similarly, we're gonna try to find what's the largest possible value of nullity of A. Then we're gonna try to figure out what's the smallest possible of each of these. probably a more succinct way of phrasing this, but I'm sticking with what I have in my notes. And so the smallest rank, smallest possible nullity. 
So basically we're just saying we don't know anything about this matrix except for its dimensions. And we're going to try to use the rank nullity theorem and basically what we know about matrices to try to figure out um, what these kind of upper and lower bounds are for the rank and the nullity. Okay. So I'm going to just kind of draw a, a picture of what A could look like because it will help us be able to refer to it. So A is going to be um, 3 by 5. I'm going to make it a little wider. So that means that it's going to have three rows and five columns. So to start to answer the first question, so the, the first question is saying, what's the largest possible value of the rank of A? So I think the, the best way to answer this is to think about what space is um, the so remember the rank is the dimension of the column space. So let's try to think about what space is the column space of subspace of. So the column space, and maybe let me number these four so we can do the work for them below and it will look organized. So to figure out uh, number one, we can say that the column space of A is a subspace of R3, right? Because the column space is the span of the columns. And if you picture what this vector looks like, or sorry, this matrix looks like, its columns each have three components. So that means that if you were to take the span of those columns, you would get a subspace of R3. So now we also want to think about how many vectors we have, right? We have five vectors. So if you have five vectors um, that together form a subspace of R3, it is possible for it to be all of R3, right? It's kind of like the example we did actually just before this, where we had three vectors whose span was R2. So if you have more vectors than the number of components in the vectors, it is possible if those vectors are, enough of them are linearly independent for their span to be all of, in this case, R3. So that tells us that the largest possible value of the rank is going to equal three. Now, if we had only had two, if this was, let's say, like a three by two matrix, that would change our answer, and we'll see that in our next example. But because we had vectors in R3 and we had five of them, that tells us that it is possible for those vectors to span all of, um, all of R3. Okay, so let's think about the next one. So the largest possible value of the nullity of A. So, and actually I should write down, let me just go back to number one and write down one other thing. So um, we have, just for the sake of if you're looking back at these notes for you to have a little more written down. Um, so we have five vectors in R3. So it is possible for them to span R3. And if they span R3, that means the dimension of the column space is 3. So that's why I put a 3 up there as our first answer. Okay, so second question is now thinking about the largest possible value of the nullity. So once again, I think thinking just about the null space. So the nullity is the dimension of the null space. So we want to think about um, what space is the null space a subspace of. It's a lot of spaces. So null A, so the null space of a matrix has to do with vectors that are getting multiplied with the matrix, right? So when we're thinking about the null space of a matrix, we should be thinking about vectors that can be multiplied with that matrix. And specifically, we're looking for uh, vectors that when you multiply them, you get all zeros out. Um, but the type of vector that you can multiply with a three by five matrix is a vector that has five components. So basically that tells us that um, the null space is a subspace of R5. 
And we don't really know anything about, you know, what that null space is going to be, but the largest it could possibly be is it could be all of our five. And that would actually happen if our original matrix was just all zeros. It would basically mean that any matrix or any vector you plugged in would go to the zero vector, and that would happen if our original matrix was all zeros. So that tells us that the largest possible value of the um, the largest possible uh, dimension of the null space is five, and so that means the largest possible possible value of the nullity is equal to five. Okay, so so far we didn't have to use rank nullity. So far we were just thinking about this kind of subspace idea. Um, but to answer the next two, now we're gonna wanna actually think about rank nullity. So the next question is the smallest possible value of the rank of A. So we know that the rank of A plus the nullity of A in this case, it's supposed to add up to five, right? Because it adds up to the total number of columns. So if the largest possible value of the nullity is five, that would mean that the smallest possible value of the rank is gonna be zero, right? Because whenever the nullity is largest, that's when the rank is gonna be smallest. So let me write that down. Um, so the largest possible rank is, or sorry, um, largest possible nullity is five. So the, the smallest possible rank you could get would be zero plus five is equal to five. So this would be our, um, our smallest possible rank. Okay, similarly for the last one, it's asking what is the um, smallest possible value for the nullity of A. So again, looking at the fact that the rank and the nullity add up to five, well, the largest that the, the rank can be is three. And so that means that the smallest that the nullity could be is two, right? Because they have to add up to five. So the largest possible, um, what are we answering here? Largest possible rank is three. And so again, it says like the bigger the, the rank is, the smaller the nullity will be. So when the rank is its biggest possible, that will give us the smallest possible nullity. So that means we're gonna be looking at three for the rank and then two for the nullity is gonna equal five. And so that tells us that the smallest possible nullity is equal to Okay, I know that was kind of a lot, but um, it's basically just, again, thinking about dimension and then just using this rank nullity theorem. Okay, so we're gonna do another similar example. So maybe now, you know, especially if you didn't do that last one yourself, maybe try to do this one yourself. Um, it plays out a little bit differently, but I think it would be a good one to try. So now let's say that instead, um, A is a, uh, five by three matrix. So if A is a five by three matrix, what is the, and so again, we'll do um, largest, and I'm just gonna be a little bit more lazy about how I'm writing this down. So I'm just gonna say the largest possible rank the largest possible nullity the smallest possible rank and the smallest possible nullity
Okay. So I think this one, I feel like I'm, I'm worried this lecture is going to be boring. So I'm going to try to add some color. Maybe that'll make it more interesting. Um, so I'm going to draw a sample matrix again. So this time we have five rows and three columns. So five by three. Okay, so let's look at the first question. So the first question is asking us the largest possible rank. So this time we're looking at the column space of A as being a subspace, not of R3, but of R5, right? Because the columns in this matrix have five entries. So the column space, the span of those columns is gonna be a subspace of R5. However, we only have three columns. So there's no possible way that their span could be all of our five. And so the largest possible dimension of the span of the columns is actually gonna be three. So if you had all three linearly independent columns, then that would mean that you would have a three-dimensional subspace of R5. So, um, oop. but we only have three columns. So um, the column space of A is at most a three dimensional subspace of R5. So it's kind of like, you know, maybe just to make it simpler to picture, let's say we had a three by two matrix, then that would mean you would have two vectors in R3. Two vectors in R3 gives you a plane in R3. So similarly here, three vectors could at most give you some kind of a three dimensional subspace in R5, whatever that looks like. And so that tells us that you know, because we just said three-dimensional, that means that the largest possible rank in uh, of this matrix would be three. Okay, I'm gonna switch up the colors. Let's do um, a nice blue. So next question is the um, largest possible nullity. So again, I think it's good to think about, you know, what kind of vectors would you be multiplying this with? And you'd be multiplying it with vectors that are three by one. So the null space of A is a subspace of R3. And again, if we, if this matrix was all full of zeros, then that would mean that the null space would be all of R3, right? Because if you have a matrix of all zeros, any vector in R3 that you multiply it with you're gonna get the zero vector. So if every single vector that you possibly could multiply it with is in the null space, that means that the null space is all of our three and therefore the dimension would be three. And so the largest possible nullity in this case is also three. Okay, so next two questions is where we'll pull in the, the rank nullity theorem. So next question is what is the smallest possible rank? So again, here we wanna use the fact that the rank of this matrix plus the nullity of this matrix, in this case, it actually has to add up to three, right? Because that's the number of columns. So we're saying that the very biggest that the rank could be, or sorry, the nullity could be is three. So that means that in order to in order to find the smallest possible rank, we're looking at when is the nullity biggest, right? So the biggest nullity is three, and so that would give us the smallest rank being zero. I don't know why I wrote zero on the right-hand side. That should be equals three. So that tells us that the smallest possible rank is zero. And then very similarly, we can figure out that the um, smallest possible nullity is also gonna be zero. So again, the rank plus the nullity has to equal three. This time we're thinking about what's the biggest rank. So biggest rank is three. And then we're trying to get that to add up to three. And so that means the smallest nullity will be also zero. 
So somewhat surprisingly, the numbers really played out differently than in the past example. So it really does matter um, what the dimensions of your matrix are. Basically, you know, if I were to kind of summarize what it has to do with, it's it's the fact that the rank and the nullity just add up to three. So because the, the number of columns is less than the number of rows, um, that kind of restricts things a little bit more than in the previous example. Okay. I feel like this is going to be a lot of me talking. I guess that's that's all this really is, isn't it? Um, but the nice thing with these videos is, right, you can pause them, take a break, if it feels like it's just going on and on. Um, so there's one more thing I wanted to talk about um, that I brought up at the end of the last lecture, and then I ended up kind of cutting it out because I decided it would be re better to talk about it today. Um, so that's kind of connecting rank nullity to just like a more intuitive way to think about it and especially thinking about it in terms of linear transformations. Um, so some of the stuff I'm gonna write down is gonna be a little like unprecise, I guess I would say, because I'm, I'm really just trying to kind of give you um, a way to think of this intuitively. So the first thing that I wanna think about is, you know, rank and nullity having to add up to a fixed number. You know, what does that tell you about the rank and the nullity? So it basically tells you, so let me write that down. Um, so since the rank of a matrix plus the nullity of a matrix add up to a fixed number, so that tells you, like, let's say you, you know the number of columns in a matrix. Um, basically, it tells you that the bigger the rank of that matrix is going to be, the smaller the nullity is, and vice versa. So basically what we saw in, in the last example. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of summarize it this way. And you could also write it the other way, but I'm going to write it as um, the larger nullity of A is the smaller the rank of A is. So it's like I said in the last video, it's kind of this push and pull between, um, between the two uh, quantities. Um, so one thing that we mentioned, or I, I hopefully mentioned at some point, um, well, I definitely mentioned that. So if the null space of a matrix is just the zero vector, what does that tell you about the matrix? So it tells you that the columns are linearly independent, right? So if the null space of a matrix is just the zero vector, that means that basically you have only the trivial solution to the homogeneous system of equations, and that means that the columns are linearly independent. So another way of saying that is that if the nullity is zero, right, nullity being zero would mean the same thing, would mean that the columns are linearly independent. And so you can kind of think of the nullity as a measurement of how not linearly independent the columns are. So as, as you have a bigger and bigger null space, as the nullity gets bigger and bigger, you're getting kind of further and further away from having um, linearly independent columns. And so what I'm about to write down isn't, again, not, it isn't like precisely correct, but I still think it's kind of a, a worthwhile way of thinking about it. Um, so the less linearly independent, inde I did this last time to independent, the columns of A, R. And the reason that this is not really technically correct is that a set of vectors is either linearly independent or it's not. There's no more or less linearly independent. So you know, this isn't technically correct. But what I mean by this is like, for example, if you have three vectors in R3, if their span is just a line, that means they're very, very linearly dependent, right? They're all the same copy of the same vector or multiples of the same vector. Whereas if you have three vectors in R3 whose span is a plane, somehow that feels like they're a little bit less dependent. So that's what I mean by this like more or less dependent thing. Um, but yeah, so what I'm saying here is that the bigger the nullity is, 
the further and further you get from being the columns being linearly independent. So if the larger the nullity is, the smaller the rank is, that means that as the columns get less and less linearly independent, they also have a smaller span, right? Because the rank is a measurement of how much those columns span. Um, so the smaller their span is. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like if you have columns that are all linearly independent, you know, that's going to really allow you to access more space versus the, the kind of more linearly dependent they are, the smaller that span will end up being. And then one other way of phrasing this kind of in terms of linear transformations is the less one to one um, a linear transformation is. So again, being one to one or not is 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 a pro you can't be more or less one to one. So again, this is like not really technically correct, but. Again, I just mean in the same sense that I wrote less linearly independent. And we'll see some examples in a minute that I think will clarify what I mean by that a little bit more. But the less one-to-one -one a linear transformation is, um, the less onto. Oops. And so where does this onto thing come from? It's because, so remember that the range of a linear transformation is um, the same as the span of the columns of its matrix. So maybe I'll, I'll write that as well. So I said the less onto it is, um, another way of thinking of that is, or the smaller its range is. Okay, so I just wanna show you a few examples of different linear transformations, just so we can kind of see what I mean by all this, that like, this, what happens as you kind of bring the nullity higher and higher? How does that affect the rank? So let me, I'm just going to switch colors just for fun. Let's try this green. Okay, so we're going to look at three different, I'm just going to write the matrices, but we're going to be thinking of them as though they're linear transformations. So first one. Okay. So this, if we were thinking of the linear transformation associated with this matrix, um, what would this do to, if you were to multiply it with a vector in R3? Well, it would scale E1 by two, it would scale E2 by three, and it would scale E3 by four. It's kind of like the, the matrix that you had for the, um, that homework question about the ellipsoid and scaling the unit sphere to get an ellipsoid. So, all this is basically doing is scaling, right? This is a, um, this is just scaling R3 in various directions by various amounts. And so this is a um, one to one linear transformation, right? It's not compressing anything onto anything else. Every vector is getting mapped to its own individual vector. It's just getting scaled. You're not gonna have two vectors that kind of end up in the same place by getting stretched. And so the nullity of this linear transformation or this matrix is gonna be zero because when a, a transformation is one-to-one, -one, when the columns are linearly independent, uh, the nullity is gonna be zero. Only the zero vector is mapped to zero, basically is what it means when the nullity is zero. Um, so the rank is basically saying the dimension of the span of the columns. So in the context of linear transformations, you can think of rank as just being the dimension of the range, right? The, the range is the span of the columns. So if we're looking at these three columns and we're thinking about, you know, what is their span or even just thinking about this transformation, right? The transformation is just um, stretching all of our three. The range is still going to be all of our three. We're not compressing into some other dimension. And so therefore the rank is going to be all of uh, or the um, rank is going to be three. Okay, so now let's compare that to a slightly different transformation. Um, so let's say we had two, zero, 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 three, zero, 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 zero. 
So maybe pause and try to think about what this transformation does. I'll, I'll just go straight through it, but, um, but I think it would be good practice to remind yourself what this transformation is. Um, so this one was actually on the, the quiz, or at least something very similar. Um, so this is going to take all of our three and project it onto um, the x, y axis. So it's basically, if you were to multiply this with any vector x, y, z, what would happen is that you would be scaling e1, or the x component, by 2, scaling e2, or the y component, by 3, and then the third component would just go to 0. And so this is going to be a projection onto the x, y axis. And so in this case, if we try to think about what is the kernel of this transformation, or what is the null space of this matrix, it's the same thing. Um, so as you hopefully saw in the quiz, it's basically anything that lies on the z axis, because if something lies on the z axis, that means that it's x and y coordinates are both zero. And so when you compress it down to the xy axis, it will end up at zero, zero, zero. So that means that we have an entire line being mapped to the zero vector. And so what's the dimension of a line? It's one. So the nullity is one because the null space is consists of the span of one vector, specifically the vector um, zero, zero, one. And by the way, if you don't like this kind of geometrical thinking, you could totally do this by solving and finding the null space that way. But I, for the sake of this, I want to kind of talk about it more intuitively. So now the rank, well, the rank is going to be the, the range or the dimension of the range of this linear transformation. So if you think about it, if you're starting in R3 and then you're projecting it onto the xy axis, well, that means that the... Um, the range is just going to be a two-dimensional subspace, right? It's just going to be a plane, the x or, or sorry, I wrote x, y axis. I meant to write x, y plane. My bad. So the, the range of this linear transformation is going to be a plane. And, you know, what's the dimension of a plane? It's dimension two. So, you know, notice that from the last one to this one, we're kind of making this less, uh, one to one, you know, the, the first one we started with was one to one, this one's not. Um, and then additionally, the the range or the rank is is getting smaller. So we can even take that one step further. And so now let's say that we have a linear transformation uh, from R3 to R3, where here's our matrix. So again, you might want to pause and try to figure out for yourself, um, what is this transformation going to do? So this one is actually going to project onto just the x-axis. Um, and I should say, actually, I guess on the last one too, it's a projection onto the xy plane, and then there's also some scaling going on. But in terms of answering the, the questions about nullity and rank, the scaling isn't really going to make a difference. Um, so similarly, this one, it is going to scale E1 by 2. But the, the kind of more important thing in this case is that it's also forgetting about the y and z coordinates. And so that means that it's project projecting onto the x-axis. And so thinking about the nullity kind of in this more intuitive way, we're just thinking about um, what is the space that is getting mapped to the zero vector. So if you're taking all of our three and projecting it onto the x-axis, Anything that lies on the y, z plane is going to end up on the zero vector. Because basically, um, you, in order for something to get sent to zero, 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 it's, um, its y and z coordinates are both going to have to be zero, and then the x coordinate can be anything. So if you think about what are the places in space where the y and z coordinates are both zero and x can be anything, and it's going to be the yz plane. So um, that means that the nullity in this case is 2, because we have a two-dimensional um, plane that is all being mapped to 0. And then if we think about what is the rank, 
Well, the rank is going to be the range of this linear transformation, and we're taking everything and projecting it onto a line, the x-axis. And so the rank is just going to be 1. So again, we see this kind of pattern of like the more we add to the nullity, the more we kind of take away from the rank. Okay, so there was something else I wanted to get to today, but I think this video has gotten long enough, so I think I'm going to actually probably stop here and then um, probably just make a really short worksheet that kind of hints at some other stuff that we'll then recap in the next video. Um, there is some really important stuff we need to get in the next get to in the next video, but um, but I'm just afraid that this is going on too long and I will lose your attention. So I will stop this here. Um, and thank you for watching. And um, one thing I just wanted to mention, I can't remember if I said this in the last video. I don't think I did. Um, if you have any questions based on this lecture, anything came up that was confusing, um, of course you can always email me, but it might also be helpful to write a comment on the, just, you know, comments on the video. Uh, that way other students can see your comment and I will be checking that and replying to comments there as well as to emails. Um, so thank you and I will uh, talk to you all again tomorrow.